Well, I want to share a message with you this morning that I'm calling, Come and See. Can I hear someone say, Come and See? But before we get into it, let's have a word of prayer. Would you lift both hands as high as you can? Keep, keep the piano going. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence and we thank you so much. We understand that you are God and we are your creation. Everything that we need is going to come from you. And everything that we have comes from you. I pray that every single person at the sound of my voice would lean into you this morning and receive from you what you are wanting to give to us. That we wouldn't be just hearers of the word alone, but that we would be doers. We would step off of the sideline and we would get in the game and say, God, whatever role you want me to play, show me and I'll do it. I'll go. I'll serve. I'll give. Whoever it is, whatever it is you want, God. I want to give it to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on. Give me the Lord a praise. As you're being seated, would you give the person next to you a high five and you may be seated? Well, how, uh, the way I want to start this message off this morning is by telling you what people are saying about you. Can I do that? It's like you're in the principal's office now. You're like, oh man, what are you going to say? Your hands start to sweat, you start to get cold. And I want to kind of come down here on your level. And over the past maybe two to three years, uh, people have been coming from all different places around the country, around the state, around the city. And, uh, you know, the past couple of years has been kind of weird. Not kind of weird, it's been like unprecedented. And as the church, we have a responsibility not to follow a mandate, but to follow the standard of the, of the word of God. Amen. We don't go by what, what man says. We go by what the word of God says. It's been established before even the world uh, came to be, before even time, space, and matter was even a thing. And so we, we, we stand on the word of God because that is unchangeable, unmovable, impenetrable. And so... If you want to get it right, you, you go to the Word of God and you, you'll follow the Word of God. Not just hear it, but you'll do it. And so we've been having people looking and searching because their churches may be closed down or maybe they were just, just, just doing online. And we were open before a lot of other churches decide to open. And when the people would come in and I had an opportunity to be able to talk to them and say, Hey, I just want to hear from you. Like what, what was your experience? Did you feel, did you feel the warmth? Did you feel welcome? Um, if you could critique, uh, this church, cause I'm always wanting, I always want to better myself. I'm not, I'm never satisfied with where I am, but I'm, I'm always moving. And I want to, I just want to, I want, I don't want to assume that just because God did what he did yesterday, that he wants me to do the same thing today. And so God, like lead me guide me, direct me, where do you want me to go? And so the number one answer that I would get, that I continue to get back, even as, as recent as last week, wasn't that we had great music, even though I feel like we do, we have great music here. Uh, it wasn't the, the preaching, even though we have amazing preaching, right? Come on. Come on. <laughs> All right. Anywho. Um, it wasn't... The number one thing that they, they, that's just reoccurring over and over and over again is that when they come to joy, they experience a joy that is authentic, that is, it's not made up, it's authentic, it's, what's another word for authentic? Real, genuine, 100, if you're doing emojis, right? Was that pure. pure? And so when when they say that about you, I begin to get your face in my in my in my head, and God will bring bring to my attention those of you who are in here because every single one of us were at one time in impossible situation, and the people who are coming in don't know your story. They don't know the context of where you were and who you were, what you were going through and the things that you said and the things that you've done. 
And so they come in, in the situ- maybe in the situation that you used to be in, and they're experiencing this joy, and they know what fake is. We, we all have that radar. We know what fake is. We know the difference between genuine and real, authentic. And when people come in, that's the number one thing that they experience when they come to joy. And I want you to know, every single one of you are, are my joy and my crown. And, and when I think of you and I think of the individual, those of you individuals who, before you, you came into this place, when I met you for the first time, you weren't kind of lost. You were like really lost. <laughs> you were broken. And, and when I think of uh, one, of the, one of the faces that comes to my mind is, is Clay, uh, a brother who was coming here, invited you to a men's breakfast. And I remember you sitting there around that circle of men with your arms crossed and you looked like you weren't getting anything. But how many years ago was that? Seven, eight years ago. And when I look, when I see the clay seven years, seven, eight years ago and the clay today, night and day, completely different. It's not because of the church. It's not because of a pastor. It's not because of anything, but because of of Jesus, the presence of God in your life. Yeah. Give the Lord a praise. I'm not done yet though. And then I continue to, to kind of just go through the, my, my mind works like a Rolodex. It just, and I think my mind works a lot faster than my body does. So I'll trip over myself. But I think of a Paul. How many, how long ago was it that you came in? Two years. Two years. So it's more and more fresh. Still got, still got that uh, new car smell. I remember when the first time I met Paul, I was standing right here. And he was in the hospital. He was on his deathbed with cancer. And Michelle was like, she had the phone in her hand. And I was like, oh, what's coming up? What's going on? She said, hey, I want you to talk to my friend. He needs help. He needs to talk to you, pastor. I had just gotten through preaching. We were, we were done. It was a glorious day. And then I, so I said, okay, what are you going to do? <laughs> So I grabbed the phone and said, hey, how's it going? Uh, this is Pastor Brandon. Uh, wh- what do you need? And at that moment, I prayed for him. And so today you are healed from cancer. You don't, in remission. In remission, yeah. And I, and I talked to you before service just to double check on my, my, uh, my account that you, you were on your way out. You were on your deathbed. You met Christ. You had this idea of Christ. You had this idea of religion and, and God, but you didn't know him. You knew of him, but you didn't know him. He stepped in many times throughout my recovery. Yeah. Uh, there's no other way. It would have been, uh, I would be here today. Yeah. Without some uh, intervention. Hallelujah. Yeah. So what Paul said, for those of you who are watching online, that God stepped in at different areas throughout his journey and just kept revealing himself and saying, just come to me, you know, all who are heavy laden, who are carrying those heavy burdens of this world, and I, I will, I'll give you rest for your soul. And I can see it in you. This, just the, the short two years that I've known you, there's been a huge growth, a huge maturity, a huge development, and it has nothing to do with your pastor, has nothing to do with this church, even though we ha- God uses uh, he uses those tools and those, I'm not going to discredit the church or, or where God has put me, but okay. Thank you. Um, but it's because of the presence of God, you know, because the same presence that changed you is the same presence of God that changed me. You know what I mean? So like we're, we're in the same, we're, we're in the same boat. And then, then I continue to think about, uh, so then Lexi, I'm gonna get you. So I remember Lexi, as a, as a young girl, do you remember how old you were when you first started coming to church with your mom? Like five, six years old. So five, six years old. Whew. And I remember that. You would be up in the front, your mom would have, be up in the front row. You would come in, be in the front row. And that little girl, 
Um, and just at, at a certain point, you just kind of disappeared. Didn't, didn't know, kind of see you online, you know, social media and stuff. And then you, you, came, you came back. And I can remember you were, you were sitting over here, standing over here, and I could hear her singing. Uh, and you hadn't yet committed yourself yet. You weren't committed yet. And so I said, hey, Lexi, have you ever considered singing on the worship team? Have you ever start? And she said, actually, yes. And if I remember correctly, you're like, yeah, I can have. I said, well, I want you. I want you to serve. I want you to, to, to be a part of the worship team and to sing with us. And uh, ever since then, you know, I just, I've, I've seen in you a growth, a development, and a maturity in you, in your spirit, you know? And it's cool because not only am I seeing, but everyone else is seeing it too. And you're also seeing it in your children and your two young ones. As now we have little children who are now being affected by the choice that we were able to make in responding to the call of Jesus Christ on our lives. And now it's having an effect on the next generation. Because God's faithfulness doesn't just stop with your generation, but his faithfulness is from generation to generation. And just as faithful as he was on day one, he is just as faithful now. And I want to remind you that. And I can just keep going on and on and on. And you guys are probably thinking, who's he going to pick next? <laughs> I'm not going to pick on anyone else. But I, just, I want you to know that you are my joy and my crown. And you encourage me. And you've probably seen in me, man, like six, what was it, six years ago that something like that. My, my dad passed away. And um, I, I was, I was going to do anything and everything that my dad needed and wanted. I, I would assist you, dad. But as far as being a pastor, oh, heck no. I'll leave that up to you. I've, I've grown up in your, in your house. I know what a pastor goes through. I know what a pastor <laughs> sees, hears. And I don't want none of that. And then my dad passes away and God speaks to my heart and says, hey, Brandon, will you, will you preach my gospel? And in that moment, because some, some, some people have said, well, you kind of had to, right? It was your thing. No, I, have, I, have, I had options. I could have gone a lot of different areas, different ways, but I made the choice to say, yes, Lord, I will preach your gospel, even though that's the most insecure thing in my life. That's the, the, the least, th the thing that I want to do least. Like that's the back, like out of all, all the lists, that's not even on the list of things I want to do. And God was like, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And so... So here we are, and you've, probably, you've, you've seen the growth in me and how it's just God, just, it's God. It's the presence of God in a life that does the changing. As we, are, as we humble ourselves, as we submit to him and surrender to him, he takes us and just does wonderful things in and through us for his glory and for the good of his creation. And that's, that's what I want to kind of talk about this morning. Uh, starting off with James, the first chapter, the, the 22nd verse, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, everyone say otherwise. otherwise. You are only fooling yourself. You're playing church. You're not doing anything uh, for, for the kingdom of God if you're just hearing. You're not doing any good for yourself or your family if you're only hearing, if you're, if you're getting a, a sanctuary seat warm with, you know, with your cheeks. It doesn't do anything, anyone any good until you begin to apply the word of God. And James makes it absolutely clear. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. And I, 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 want, I want to encourage you. If you've been obedient to God's word in doing his word, continue. Push even harder. Don't be satisfied with what, what happened yesterday. Continue to push forward. God, I want to, I want to give more of myself to you. And then those of you who have not yet, you, you, you hear the voice. <laughs> it's in your heart. It's in your spirit to drop certain things in your life, but you're still holding on to it and wondering why God won't, his favor won't be on your life, why his hand doesn't, doesn't do in your life what it's doing in others' lives because their lives are surrendered and yours isn't. You know what I'm saying? If I just put it bluntly, because I'm not here to play church, church. 
I want to see people. I want to see lives changed. I want to see all of us get old and older and see the children who are coming up behind us coming up in, in, the, in, the, in the teaching, in the, the admonition of, of, the, of the word of God as they begin to uh, affect and impact the generation that's coming after them. As this thing just grows and just as it explodes. And we see in John, the first chapter, this is where we're going we're to start this train here. Someone say, come and see. Come and see. John, the first chapter, the 19th verse. Now, this was John's testimony, talking about John the baptizer. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. John was making an impact. John the baptizer was making an impact on the, the nation of Israel. He had a lot of followers. He was baptizing a lot of people in the river. And so the, the Jewish leaders were coming to him, sent, sent some, some people to him to ask him, who, who are you? What are you doing? Like, how is this happening? There's so much power and authority behind what you're doing. In verse 20, notice, notice what he says. He did not fail to convet, confess, but confessed freely. It was like right off the bat. He's, he's probably thinking, I know what you're thinking, but I am not the Messiah. I know how badly you want me to be that because I fit. I probably fill all those boxes that you need, need me to fit, to fill. And if he wanted, if John wanted to, he could have said, yeah, I'm the guy. And they would have worshiped him and he would have gone through their lives and realized that he's not. And they would, that would have come to that, that point. But he said immediately, I am not the Messiah. And we need to realize that we are not the Messiah. We aren't the savior of our families. We might be the avenue that the savior uses to save our family. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if we think we're the savior, we'll put this weight on our shoulders and on our lives that is too heavy to carry, uh, that we're uh, too heavy for us to carry, and it will end up crushing us and everyone sinks. But if we realize that the power and the authority is in the spirit of God and we rely on him and we just do what he tells us to do, We'll begin to see people who are, were, who are in possible situations like we were come to Christ and be saved. And I don't care what their background is. I don't care what nationality they are. Jesus Christ breaks, he crosses all boundaries. If you think you're disqualified, he will come to your life and he will qualify you. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've come from, what, what, what God you used to serve, or what traditions and rituals you used to be a part of. God will come in and he will change all of that for his glory because he's the, he's the only God, right? And so John says, I'm not the Messiah. I think I need to hurry up a little bit, get, get through this. Uh, they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Because that would be cool. He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet that, that Moses was talking about in Deuteronomy? He answered, no. <laughs> Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us because they're gonna be, ask, they're gonna be asking and if we don't give them an answer, we're, we're gonna get in trouble. So what do you say about yourself? Who are you? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet because it was actually prophesied. God prophesied through the prophet Isaiah that John would come and he, so he he says the words of of Isaiah the prophet he says I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness make straight the way for the Lord so what John is saying is I'm the one that was sent by God to prepare the people of Israel and to get them ready to receive the Messiah the Christ the one who that was sent by God to be the savior of the world in 24 now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him why then, if, if you're not the Messiah, why then do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? This is the thing. When you know what you've been called to do, people will try to twist things. They will try to get things out of you um, and try to trip you up. But if, you know, if you're confident in who you are and who has called you, it doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what people will think or try to trip you up with. He's, he, he said, I, I baptize with water. John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. 
He, he didn't have to justify. He didn't have to prop himself up and say, well, yeah, I, I was sent, so I'm kind of important too. He stepped to the side. He said, no, I'm not the one. I, I, I can only baptize with water, but among you stands one you don't even know. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. He ranks so far above me that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and to even touch his sand, his dirty sandals. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. In 29, someone say the next day. The next day. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God. And so John, he always had a crowd around him. He had a lot of disciples. He had a lot of people who were following him. And so he pointed at Jesus and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was what? Before. He before me. And if you go all the way back to the beginning of, of the gospel according to John, the beginning of this chapter, this book, you see where John starts off this writing here by saying, in the beginning. And in the beginning was the word. Talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. But not only was this word with God, but this word was God. Not a God, but the God. God. And so he says here, let me, let me read what he says again. A man who comes after me. So I did my ministry. I fulfilled my calling. Uh, has surpassed me, has come and passed me up because he, he outranks me because he was before me. He, he not only is he, 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 he is God. Let me hear someone say, he is God. He is God. And so he, he came, he, is, he was before me. He says, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water, he's talking about his calling, his purpose. The reason I came baptizing with water was for this reason that Jesus might be revealed to Israel. He wasn't going to allow anyone or anything to shake him from his calling. He was focused like a laser beam on what God wanted him to do. And I'm telling you, that's where you want to be. It might be difficult. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. There are some decisions you're going to have to make that people aren't going to like that are going to go against the grain. It's going to go against the culture. But when you're in the favor of God, his protection and his provision will surround you. And wherever you go, you will have the hand of God and the favor of God in your life. I would rather have that than to be outside of my calling and frustrated every day because nothing's going right. My family's falling apart. My, my, I can't keep money in the bank. My car. You know, everything just seems to fall apart like a country music song, right? And so John was focused on his calling to honor God, not so that he could be seen, even though that was the important part. If you're not seen or heard, <laughs> that's kind of part of it, but he didn't do it to be seen. He did it because that was going to glorify God, that was going to honor him. And then John gave this testimony. He begins, to, we, we see the story, the, the, the actual story of this um, in Mark. If you go to the gospel according to Mark, you see when, when John baptized Jesus. And now he's, he's, give, he's giving from his own account of what happened. He said, I saw the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And that's important because this is what God said would happen. He said, when this happens, know that this is the one that I've sent. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me, talking about God the Father. So we have the Spirit of God. We have the, God the Father who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain, this is the one 
who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So John understood that he was baptizing with water, but he was only preparing the people for the one who would come and baptize them with fire, with the Holy Spirit, with power, with authority that is unmatched. Amen? Amen. And so he's given his testimony. And he says, I have seen and I testify to you today that this is God's chosen one. Exactly what God told me about what would happen with the one who would be chosen happened when I baptized Jesus. The spirit came down like a dove and it didn't just touch him, but it remained on him. And this is the one who was going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Uh. And then 35, someone say the next day. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. I can just see as he elbows his disciples, two of his disciples, one on, one on each side, right? Hey, look, the Lamb of God. This, this is who I've been talking about. When the two disciples heard him say this, notice what they did. They followed Jesus. And I love just reading through this story of John. We can go a lot of different directions but I see where John, he just remains humble. A lot of us, if we were in the same situation, we'd say, hey, wait, we grab them by their shirt collar. Where are you going? Come back here. You were, you were kind of, you were, you were affirming me. You were, you were legitimizing who I am and what I'm doing. But since John knew who he was and what he was doing, that actually, that's what he came to do. He came to prepare people to follow Jesus to be led to Christ, there was, not, there was no, he, he, he welcomed it. Even though they were changing their loyalty from, from John and following John to Jesus now, and they're going to follow Jesus, I can just imagine as John was like grinning and like just maybe felt that confirmation. God, he saw his disciples walking away, but it was a confirmation of God. You're doing this. This is actually happening. He was living the Bible, you know? The Bible didn't exist yet, but he was, he was living what we read about today. How cool is that? So they followed Jesus, turning around. So Jesus, he kind of felt them breathing on his neck. And Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you guys want? What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Notice they didn't ask for anything. They didn't, they just wanted to know, where, where are you going? Where are you staying? We just, we just want to be with you. And I love this in 39. We see the invitation. Jesus says, come and you will see. Someone say, come and see. Come and see. That's always the invitation. We read last week in, and in the, actually the past two weeks in Psalm 34, where, where the, the psalmist, he writes, uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you will taste the Lord for yourself and you'll observe the Lord for yourself, you won't turn back. You, <laughs> you would be foolish to taste the Lord and to observe who he is and what he's accomplished and what he's able to do in a, in, in, in a center. And then to turn around and be, ah, that was okay, but there's be- I've seen better. Would be a fool. Come. And you'll see. I love the invitation. Because the invitation is for everyone. Someone say, so they went and saw. He said, come and you will see. So they went and they saw. So they, they accepted, uh, they responded to the, to the call, to the invitation. And they, they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Someone say Andrew. Andrew. Andrew, this is the first time we get to see Andrew here. He steps into the scene. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Can't I just be Andrew? You know? Why do I have to be Andrew, Simon Peter's brother? (laughs) So Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said. So he was one of the two disciples that John said, hey, look, the lamb. And Andrew was one that followed who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus, the first things, let me hear someone say the first thing. 
the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, his brother Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. Messiah is the Hebrew word and Christ is the Greek word. They mean both the same thing, the anointed one, the chosen one of God. And I began to read this. I, I began to think of my, my, my 11 and my nine-year-old and how my, my nine-year-old adores his brother. Sometimes it's hard to watch. But he just loves, like, so Lucas, he loves his brother, Lyric. Like, Lyric can do no wrong. I kind of feel sometimes that Lyric doesn't, he, he couldn't care less sometimes. He's like the macho guy. Like, I'm the older brother, you know. But anything that Lucas does, he wants, he, like, before he tells daddy, he goes and tells Lucas, or Lyric. He'll go, hey, Lyric, look what I did. This is awesome. He wants to share it with his older brother. He wants to share it with his sibling, with his brother. Whatever happens in his life, whatever he experiences, he wants his brother to be a part of it too. And we see Andrew doing the same thing here. The first thing Andrew did was go out and find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. And in verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. In another translation, it says, and he led him to Jesus. Isn't that what we're called to do? When we make it about us, it's almost like salvation stops when we got saved. When we make it about us, we, we like to talk about prosperity and how I, I'm going to do the prospering. Now realizing that what God did in you wasn't for you, but it was for the next person. He, what he puts in you is to be a blessing to the next generation or the people in your house, the people, your children in your family. Not to go out and find things to give to your family, but to pour out what he's already poured into you to be a blessing to your family. And we, we, we want to make it so difficult and so complicated and say, man, I don't, I don't have anything to give my family. God, I don't know what to do. And God is saying, look in your hands, son or daughter. I've, it's in your hands. Pour out of yourself into your family into the world and the people around you and bless them with what I've put inside of you and what I've blessed you with. And ultimately, we're here to lead others to Christ. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. We all know Peter, right? You see, whenever a person responds to the call and invitation to follow Christ, and it's genuine, it's authentic, it's, it's real, what immediately follows 100% of the time is change. Change. There's a transformation that takes place from the inside out. The person is no longer loyal to their sin or to the temptations of the world or to their flesh, but to the spirit of God that now lives within them. Amen? Amen. They're no longer bound and held captive to the spirit of darkness or to the things of this world, but now have authority to be overcomers and more than conquerors in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it bugs me when I see Christians, Jesus followers, just hunched over and their life is depressing. Man, if I wasn't a Christian already, I wouldn't want what they had. I'm going to go to the club. I'm going to go to the bar. Because what you have seems to be sour. Seems to be defeating you. When you're a child of God, you become more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer, not because we know more. It's because of the presence and the spirit of God that lives inside of us. And he gives us authority over the devil, over darkness, over the enemy. He takes the darkness out of our lives and he, he, and he puts us into his marvelous light. 
And we're no longer the same. We can't. It's impossible. And so to signify to the world of this change, Jesus immediately changes Simon's name to Peter. And so just to give you some some insight here, uh, my plan was to take our Hungry for the Truth series all the way up to Easter. I thought that was a good idea. Uh, But this past week, as I was in meditation and I was praying before the Lord, I realized that God had something else in mind, and thank the Lord for that, you know? Not that there was a change in schedule, maybe a change in my schedule, but God had already planned, and it's up to us to even when we're, we're... we're hightailing it to where we think we're supposed to go. As soon as God says, hey, I want you to just take a left, take a sharp left. Do it. Don't go to Nineveh. If you know the story of Jonah. Go to where God calls you to go. And his favor will be on you. And I'm telling you, if he's calling you to say a, a word, and it's only two words, you're like, man, that sounds weird. It sounds you go speak those two words, do, just go in and out and do what he tells you to do. The change is going to happen. You leave it in God's hands. The outcome isn't up to us. It's not up to you. It's not up to me. But you do what you're called to do and God will take care of the rest. Amen? Amen. And so my plan it was to, to take our Hungry for the Truth series all the way up to Easter. But I, f- I felt God instructing me to equip you with a tool that would allow you to be the hands and feet of Christ, to take it from hearing the word and doing the word. Not just praying for people, but actually facilitating a movement of God in your life to lead people to Christ, like Andrew led his brother to Christ, right? And so this is something that we're going to be calling Operation Andrew. And so why Operation Andrew? We just read about Andrew, right? And it's incredible when we read about Andrew. And he's introduced to the reader, how John introduces him as Andrew, the the brother of Simon, as if Andrew was in the background, as if Andrew was in the shadow of his brother. But I want to tell you, church, that if it wasn't for Andrew, I don't know if we would have ever heard about Simon Peter. This is the same Peter that on the day of Pentecost, the day the Holy Spirit came and filled and dwelled his church for the first time, Peter was the one who stood up first and preached a sermon, and 3,000 people responded to the call, and they were led to Christ, and the, the number 3,000 people were added to the church on one day, the first mega church. 3,000 p- people, are you kidding me? One sermon? This wouldn't have happened if Andrew didn't invite his brother and lead him to Christ. God would have used someone else. But we would have never heard about Peter. He's the one we we read his letters in the word of God. And he's still encouraging people today through what he wrote a couple thousand years ago, right? And so when you say it like that, Andrew might not have been an an outspoken disciple or a well-known character in the Bible that we hear about from, that we hear from or we, we hear about very much, but his role is so important and it's an essential part of God's story. And without Andrew, without him and people like him and their actions, they're not just knowing, but they're doing. I believe that there'd be a lot missing and the Bible wouldn't be, it would be a lot shorter book without Andrew and people like him. The joy that Andrew had after meeting Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, face to face, the first thing he wanted to do was to go out and to find his brother and to tell his brother about Jesus. Hey, Simon! I can see him yelling him from afar. Simon, bro! We found the Messiah! 
And John lets us know that the, the very first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother and he led his brother to Christ. You see, the end game for the church, the reason we exist isn't to sing a song. Songs are good, but that's not the end game. It's not to say a prayer or to try to convince people that we're important and that they're sinners. But it's to lead people to Jesus. Is there anybody here with me? You understand what our responsibility and the opportunity that we have that is right in front of us that maybe we've been neglecting or maybe even rejecting? But what I want you to do, church, is I want you to to get some confidence and begin to walk by faith. Don't don't follow your eyesight. Your eyesight will lie to you every single time because you don't know what's going on on the inside of that person. You have no idea what God is speaking and what God is doing in another person's life. If you if you look at them, you, you maybe count them out, man. They're just a druggie, or they're just a liar. They've done this and this and this and this and this and this, and there's no hope for them. You've counted them out. And God is saying, no, you were the avenue that I wanted to use to touch them and to get through to them. Not that you're, you're, not that you're going to shake them and force them, but that you were going to lead them to me. You see, we're not the Messiah. Jesus is. The weight isn't on our shoulder. We just lead people to Christ. And I'm telling you, there are going to be people who couldn't care less. And that's not who I'm looking for. I'm looking for those who are hurting. Who realize they don't have enough. Who have counted themselves out. And they're thinking, man, there's no hope for me. You see, people who have a full bank account, they're taken care of. Right? They've got the wife, the husband or whatever, two and a half kids, the house. And in their eyes, why do I need a savior? I'm taken care of according to the standards of the culture that I live in. But I'm looking for those who were like me. I knew I was lost. I knew I was broken because I lived it. I knew what I was thinking about myself and I didn't like it. It's because I had two parents who were praying for me and, and leading me. And I finally made the decision, yeah. I had to make that decision for myself. I couldn't get, get to heaven on my, on my parents' coattails. I had to choose for myself. Yes, God, I'll, I'll follow you. I'll follow your son. First Peter 2.9 this is the same Peter that Andrew brought to Jesus and led him to Christ, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are not like that. You're not like those who, who, who uh, walk away from, who, who are being crushed and they're, because they're walking away from the truth of God's word. You're not like that, for you are a chosen people. You're, a royal, you're royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Why? Notice what he says. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. It's not that so you can throw it in people's face and say, look who I am. I, I, I'm a righteous person. You're, you're a sinner. No, 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 no. That's wrong. We are joined with Christ so that we can show the goodness of God to the world around us. He says, for he called you out of the darkness and in his wonderful light. You see, as the church, our goal and our aim is to lead people to Christ. In other words, we're here to win souls. But after that, the next step is to take those people and then to disciple them, to walk with them and to show them what it means and what it looks like to live the Christian life. And what I want to do this morning is I want to give you a tool. We're calling it Operation Andrew. If we can have our greeters come on up. And what I want you to do is I would love for every single person to take two. 
what I want you to do is, we're gonna actually give me one of those. I gave all, all of mine away. We're gonna take a look at this together. Because as a church, this is where we're headed. This is where we're going. Because there's absolutely no reason why the church shouldn't be exploding today in, in 2022. There are so many people hurting. There are so many people who are lost. They're, we, they've been in isolation for the past two and a half years. And they're looking for help. They're looking for people who are going to be genuine. They're looking for people who are going to be authentic. And I believe we have what people are looking for. We have Jesus. And as you receive that card, just, let me just tell you up front what those seven uh, spaces are for. What you're going to do is you're going to write down seven names that you're going to begin to invite. You're going to, first of all, you're going to commit to pray for, invite, and then bring them, uh, these people with you to Joy Church. You're going to lead them to Christ. And these aren't, and I want to encourage you, don't be looking, it's not something where you're thinking, man, I wish this person was a Christian. It's going to be people that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to where you've seen, maybe they're, they're asking questions. Maybe you see that they're hurting. Maybe they've opened up a little bit to you and, and they need that extra nudge and maybe no one's ever invited them yet. I heard a stat a while back how most people don't come to church because they haven't been invited. And if we will be a people who will be like Andrew, who will be so excited about Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, we've had this encounter with him and we want you to also be a part of this. Man, I want, you to, I want to lead you to Christ. I want you to come with me to church. You see, the building isn't the church. We know the church is the people. But where do the, the people, where, where do the church where do they meet? They gather in a building, right? So we want to invite them to the house. Say, come on. And Because a lot of people have been hurt by the church. But I truly believe that when people come here, they're in a safe space. Not that they won't be challenged. We all need to be challenged. But th there's, a, there's not going to be any judgment or shame. Because we all know what we've been through and what we've encountered in our own lives and the grace that God has given to us. So you're going to write seven names down. What I would, why you have two right there is because I would love for you to write those seven names down today if you're able to because I want to start praying for these right away. I want you to give the church a copy and you take home a copy this, night, uh, this Wednesday night. I want us as a church to begin to pray for these people and to see God move, God's hand move in people's lives and actually see people physically walk through those doors that we've been praying for. Is anybody else here ready to see something like that happen? I don't see. Anybody here? You just... Anybody? Let me ask again. Maybe you're, maybe you're just like involved in that paper there. Is there anybody here who wants to see the hand of God work in people's lives and see them walk through those doors? Yeah. I'm telling you, church. There's no reason why there shouldn't be an explosion in God's church. It's the best, it's the best thing we've got going. The, I remember, uh, I think, when Blockbuster was here, I think that was the best thing going on in town, when Blockbuster was here. Everyone was there. But I'm telling you, it should be the house of God. So it says on the top, Operation Andrew. We're going to be talking about this for the next couple weeks. Uh, so I'm going to try to make this brief. Operation Andrew, invite and bring the lost. Operation Andrew is a strategy that helps believers impact their city, family, friends, and coworkers with the good news. All of us know people, let me say that again, all of us know people who need Jesus and are not plugged into a church. And it's important that they don't just come to church, but they're plugged in and they're serving in some way, shape, or form. That they're, they're, they have this sense of accountability that helps, to, helps them to grow and to develop in, in their faith and their walk with Christ. Let, let's all do our part by br praying for, inviting, and bringing others to Joy Church so they can hear the good news and receive a touch from heaven. And so it says here, my operation, Andrew, souls list is right here, one through seven. I commit to pray for, invite, and bring the following people with me to Joy Church. And if you'll flip it over to the back, there's five points that are going to help you to walk this out. 
that you, that you and I, we can be the hands and feet of Christ. The first one, it says, look around. Your mission field is right where you live, work, or go to school. The word of God tells us that the, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are what? Few. few. Like, like how many people just said that? Very few. And so it's up to us as Jesus followers to be the hands and the feet of Christ. List names of individuals you know who need Jesus and pray for them regularly, like throughout the day. Number two, look up. God changes people through prayer. I believe that. Pray each day for those on your list. God will give you opportunities to share his love. Number three, look out. For, look out for ways to cultivate friendships and to earn their confidence. I'm telling you, I don't listen to people that I don't, that I don't uh, trust. And so why would anyone believe me if they don't trust me if I'm telling, trying to lead them to Christ? And so what we want to do is we want to cultivate and develop relationships with people that will facilitate conversation where they become comfortable with you. And they let their guard down and they begin to ask questions. Why are you so happy all the time? What drug are you on? <laughs> and then you can be, I know a guy. His name is Jesus. You know? So it, like an, so an invitation to dinner or, or sporting event, choose your own adventure, you know, can open up the way to talk about Christ. We're not barging in. The thing about I love about God is that he never barges in. He never, he never, forces his way in, but he gives the invitation and leaves it up to us to choose, yes, Lord, I will serve you. That's authentic. That's real. Number four, look forward. Begin to talk with each person on your list about attending Joy Church with you. Bring it up. And this is important. Choose a specific date. Don't just throw it up in the air and say, hey, maybe you should come with me to church someday. That's never going to happen. Believe me. Say, hey, my church is, is gathering this Sunday. I would love for you to, to join me. Come with me. I'll be with you. I'll be there with you. If you need a ride, I'll pick you up. You need me to be your alarm? I'll, I'll give me the house key. I'll wake you up. I'll come into your house and wake you up. I'll help you get dressed. Whatever. You know what I mean? Whatever it takes. So choose a specific date. Pray and invite them. Offer to bring them with you. Number five, look after Look after those who respond to Christ or show an interest in the gospel. This is important. You, you, we're looking for those who, who, who are responding to God's call or show an interest in the gospel. They need your encouragement. And then this is a common question here. What do I do about those who don't respond? Continue to love and pray for those who do not respond. We're not, we're not trying to force people or trying to convince people. We lead them to Christ and he does the hard stuff. The, in, the internal stuff. So to continue to love those and pray for those who do not respond. Remember to encourage all of those on your list to attend your home church regularly if they do not already have a home church. And if they haven't been in the past couple years, if they haven't been church, this needs to be their home church. They need to come here. We're gonna love on them. We're gonna encourage them. We're gonna disciple them. And uh, I'm telling you, uh, we're gonna, oh, I, I'm, just, I'm just chomping at the bit to see what God is going to do. And then it says, thank you for making an, an eternal difference, Joy Church, the address, number, and the website. And so if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them throughout the week. Not right now, of course, but if you have a question, maybe after church, you can ask me. But I would love for you to fill that out before you leave today and leave one. Just maybe leave it on the altar here. I'll collect them so that we have them. So I'm praying for them. We're praying for them. And uh, so that you're not just praying for them, but we're all praying together. Can I hear an Amen. Can I have everyone stand with me? We're going to close this out. But we can't close this out until we, until I give an invitation. I want to invite you to put your faith in Christ. That's nothing that anyone else can do for you. That's something you have to do for yourself. You have to respond to the call. When Andrew went to his brother, I'm sure his brother trusted him enough to say, I'll go. He went and met Jesus. He, he tasted and saw for himself that Jesus was good. And the rest is history. Now we're reading letters that he wrote that are in the Bible now. But if you want to place your faith in Jesus Christ today, I want to lead you in a prayer. But I want to pray with you. 
If that's you this morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, with every child of God in prayer right now for those who are making a decision right now. If that's you this morning, you want to put all of your eggs in Jesus' basket. You want to say, I'm putting my faith. I'm going all out for Jesus. There's no better life to live. I've been on, on the other side and I know what it's like. I want to step out of the darkness and into his glorious light. If that's you this morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just lift your hand up? I want to, I want to see that. Yes, I see that hand. Anyone else? Yes, I see that hand. Anyone else? Yes, I see those hands. Yes, I see that hand. Anyone? Yes, I see that hand. Those of you who are watching online, if you want Jesus today, I'm telling you, his invitation is on the table. All you have to do is pick it up and receive it and begin to follow him. For those of you who raised your hand to the invitation, that call to put Jesus as first in your life, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Would you say, Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I renounce all of my sin, all the things that, that uh, come against God, and I put all of my faith, all of my trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Savior of my soul. My life now belongs to you, Jesus. I am yours, and you are mine. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you put your hands together for Jesus this morning? If you prayed that prayer, the next step for you to take is to, to tell someone about Jesus. Let them know who he is. You don't have to know. The, the big mistake that people make is they think they have to read this whole thing in order to start telling people about Jesus. Andrew didn't even have uh, the Bible. He met Jesus. And he said, hey, come and see. We met the Messiah. I want you to come. And he led him to Christ. And Christ did all the work. As he began to follow Christ. Now go out and tell someone about what Jesus has done for you. If it's peace within your soul, or maybe it's an insecurity, maybe it's an addiction. Because when you're saved, it doesn't just mean your, your soul is saved. It means you are saved in 360 degrees. In how many dimensions? I don't know. Three dimensions? Four dimensions? I don't know. I don't know what that means. But uh, just in every area of your life, you are completely saved. You are now delivered. You're free, a free woman, a free man because of Christ. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen.